Hi guys, our notes for this week are on magnetism and they should be relatively short but we do have a little bit of homework to do. Um, only nine problems so this isn't going to be hopefully overwhelming. The notes for this week have a lot of material already in them um, so there's a little bit less writing to do and a lot of listening and thinking about and just getting the uh, equations copied down properly. There's really only one equation we just look at it from a few different variable perspectives. So <clears throat> the first thing we need to do is get started with our definition of a magnet and what a magnet is. So a few short notes here. A magnet is an object that causes a field force. Now previous to this the only field forces that we've dealt with have been uh, gravity. So remember a f it's a push or a pull that doesn't require contact to happen. So we call these long range or field forces. Um, when we're looking at magnets they come from aligning the poles of atoms so we're creating a dipole and we're going to look shortly at exactly what that means. Um, because we're talking about aligning polarity on atoms it only works with certain materials. Um, which the most common to us are metals but also you can do certain kinds of ceramics um, and nowadays you can even do certain kinds of fluids. Most of those are fluids that contain metals still but and um, the material has to have magnetic properties. It has to have a polarity, a positive and a negative side to the atoms that are in it in order for it to become a magnet. And then lastly when we look at magnets opposite poles attract and likes repel. So that's old news. That's a piece that you guys have probably known for quite some time. So we have two poles in a magnet. We usually identify them as north and south. And within our magnet, I'm going to draw a bar magnet because that's the most common one when we're getting started. We look at magnetic field lines. So we'll define magnetic field lines here in just a minute, but they are the lines that show the amount of force Remember, it's a field force. The amount of force and the direction of the force that's being caused by the object. So in a magnet, the magnetic field lines leave the north pole and enter the south pole. And this is a picture that most of you guys have been seeing since elementary school. It's not uncommon. Leaving the north pole, going into the south pole. So, the difference between this dipole and an electric dipole is because the north and south are arranged in every single atom inside of the magnet, you can't separate the north from the south. You can't draw a line and have the, the north and the south on one side because inside of the entire magnet, if I zoom in, and I look at the collection of atoms, I'm going to draw really bad atoms here. Definitely not to scale, right? All right, so definitely not to scale. Usually we draw the north as a red and the south as a blue, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And what I want you to envision is, could you, would you, is there a way to draw a single line inside of this magnet and get all the blue on one side of the line and all the red on another? And the answer is no, 
there's no way to separate the dipoles in a magnet. So the reason that this side ends up being north up here is because the predominant direction of the atoms at the end of the material are north. And the south down here is because when you look at this end, the predominant alignment, everything down here at the bottom is south. In the middle, there's not as much magnetic attraction. Sometimes we'll draw field lines um, like this on a magnet. And technically, it's very rare to see that actually happen. Because when you look up close at the magnet, if I draw a line out, well, it would be out from here and into here, I'm coming out between a north and a south and I'm going in between a north and a south. And that's not really correct. So we want to draw our field lines always as leaving, oops, I raced a little too much there, as leaving the top pole, leaving the top piece of the magnet and coming into the bottom pole or the bottom piece of the magnet. So we we'll want to put a little note right here. We can't separate our poles. Because they're in every atom. What you can do with a magnet that you can't do with a lot of other um, dipoles is if I take my magnet and it has a north and a south and I break it right down the middle, what I'll end up with are two magnets and both of those magnets are going to have a north and a south. And if I haven't damaged the atoms inside of the magnet uh, when I broke it, then they're going to be equally as strong as their parent magnet. So that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and, and it makes sense if you think about, if I'm going to grab yellow here, if I were to draw a line through here and I broke it, I would have a new set of south just above my line and I would have a new set of north just below that line. So um, that's, that's kind of an application that doesn't always exist with dipoles but definitely works with magnets. Now the problem is in order to break a, a piece of magnet, oftentimes you have to drop it or strike it or do something like that and sometimes what happens when you drop or strike is that, uh, whoops, I better go back to a color we can see, is that some of the atoms will get jarred so that their polarity turns a little bit sideways. And when not all of the atoms are perfectly aligned, then our magnet is not going to be as strong as it was before. So you have to be careful with magnets as far as banging them around. What's nice about most magnets is that you can use a stronger magnet and you can realign those atoms. So you can pull them back into um, alignment with one another. So what do we want to write here for magnetic field lines? Um, the push or pull in the space around a magnet. All right, so I think that's all we really need to write because we've taken an awful lot of pictures. What I want to do next on this first video is start to look at um, the field lines around different magnets of different shapes. So you'll see here I have a bar magnet and a cow magnet. Now for those of you who don't know, there's always a couple people that don't know, um, our farmers put magnets that are about the same size as what's on my screen right now. They're two or three inches long and they're they're made of metal inside of the cow's first stomach. Cows have multiple stomachs um, because cows are very indiscriminate eaters and as they graze they'll pick up a nail or they'll pick up um, a piece of metal in the yard and they'll swallow it and it can tear up their stomach and cause you know a lot of problems and usually death for the cow. But by putting that magnet in the first strongest stomach, um, then it keeps all of those metal chunks in that first stomach. Um, and the cows can usually live out their whole life without having to have any problems with that. So the, when I say cow magnet, I do literally mean magnet designed for cow. So what I did um, 
in class when we look at, at magnets, and, and usually we get out these four kinds of magnets that we have here to look at, we get out iron filings that are in a ferrofluid that are uh, suspended in fluid, and we play and we explore and we visually see and feel the magnetic forces on these magnets. So in our notes, as we were taking these notes, that's not quite possible. So I pulled up for us a couple of pictures, and I'm going to put them into the space on our video here, which will take a little bit of finagling, I think, but not too bad, um, so that we can look at what those iron filings would look like, what we would see, that's what's on the left, and then the corresponding um, field lines that we would draw are on the right. So you'll notice that even though the first magnet, the bar magnet, the most common one is a flat magnet, and the cow magnet is a round magnet, they have the same field lines when you're looking at them from a distance. What you would notice in class is that um, the, the field lines around the bar magnet are pretty flat, um, whereas the, the field lines, the magnetic lines and around the cow magnet are a lot more 3D. So um, what you would see in here, in this section right here, is that if you can imagine that rotating and having a solid ball of magnetic field lines, that's more what that would look like. All right, so corresponding from, from the left to the right, here's our field lines on our bar magnet. Here's how we actually draw and, and show them in, um, in a picture in a diagram on our paper. You'll notice everything is going out of the North Pole. There's arrows pointing out and into the South Pole. What I like about these top two pictures is they also show compasses what you would see on a compass. So if you can imagine taking a compass, and we do this in class too, and set it right next to the bar magnet, um, what you would notice is the red, which remember red is usually north on the needle, points towards the south pole, and the white, which is the south pole, points north. That's the opposite to track part. So we're going to work on that more in just a second. When we look at this picture of our cow magnet, we see that same alignment. But what I like about this picture is it shows how as you get closer, it has to bend to get into the pole. You don't want to go past the pole. So as our magnetic field line comes out away from the North Pole, it gets attracted to the South Pole, so it bends towards the South. As it gets a little bit too far, it realizes it's gone too far, and it turns so that it can go in right at that pole. Remember, at the end. We don't see a lot of them in the middle. Now, in class, I like to also play with ring magnets and horseshoe magnets because I don't want everybody thinking that a magnet has to be a straight line with a north and a south at both ends. So the ring magnets have a couple different configurations that are possible. Sometimes you'll find them and what they actually have is like a ring within a ring so that, and this, this is a really terrible circle that I'm drawing here on your notes, but so that you have a south on the inside and a north on the outside. Other times you have like the picture that we saw um, that you guys can see right in front of you here, north on the top, south on the bottom. The more common one is north on the top, south on the bottom. So um, over here on the left, here's what the iron filings would do, um, and again, they would wrap all the way around, so really what you would see is little spikes coming out of the top, and little spikes wrapping around and going into the bottom, out of the top and around and into the bottom, out of the top and around and into the bottom, and if you have enough iron filings, you'll find that it wraps around like that. So I couldn't find any really good images of that wrap around. All you find are like little blobs of iron filings where they're sticking out in every which direction. So um, I do really like this magnetic field picture where it shows out of the top and around and into the bottom because that ring is what you would really see. And on the inside also, but you have to be careful on the inside because the north going out this way doesn't want to run into the north going up this way. So you get this space in the middle 
where there's no field lines going through because they don't want to cross each other. And so you just get around and around and around. And then finally, um, and we'll look at this real quick, horseshoe magnets are really common magnets. Um, they, you know, they're found in a lot of places and have a lot of purposes. So what's really going on on a horseshoe magnet is they've taken a bar magnet and they've bent it. So it does have a north end and a south end, and it flows between the north and south ends, but those ends are actually in the same place. And up here in the middle, remember there's nothing that leaves the middle, so there's not a lot of field lines going on up at that end. So those, there's a couple um, different looks at magnets. Now we're getting close to where I want to stop timing, but I do want to show you guys one more thing here. And this, these are common pictures that we will have seen before, but what happens when I take two magnets and I put their north poles together, or their south poles, and what happens when I put their opposite poles together, so a north and a south. And we know these, but just putting them back in our brain and in context to make sure that we remember, this is, oops, this, ooh, it doesn't want to stay there. Opposites attract. Oh, I know why it doesn't want to stay there. I'm going between pages. And this is like charges repel. So we've seen both of those situations before. Um, and you can see the really strong turning lines here. This one is kind of interesting because they show an arrow pointing out and an arrow pointing out and it looks like they connect they wouldn't connect, they would just stop. Because the the one pole or the one uh, field line that is perfectly aligned isn't going to bend. So it's kind of an anomaly and most drawings don't draw anything in there. Most drawings just leave that empty and I think that that's the best way to think about that because there is no attraction there. There's no solid line that connects them. So, on your test, your very last test that you're going to take here in a couple weeks, there's going to be some drawing and it's going to ask you to draw when you have multiple norths and souths. And you want to make sure that anywhere that a north is close to a south, you're drawing a pattern like this. And anywhere that two norths or two souths are together, you're drawing a picture like this one. So, Definitely take the time to sketch those down in your notes. Um, you can hit pause and look at this as, as long as you need to. Um, if you need to go back up and look at those top pages, certainly they're still there too and you'll be able to hit pause if you didn't quite get enough time to get those drawings done also. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and hit stop on the recorder now and get this first video published.